Hi guys, I just wanted to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this show. It's my website of choice because they have 24 seven customer service. You get your own domain name and they have amazing designer templates that work across all devices. You can start your own online store or your own website today with a free trial at squarespace.com and you can also get a 10% discount off your first purchase using the offer code Carl. So make your next move with Squarespace. We've had a couple of emails in asking advice about how do you find models? How do you work with models? What's it like working with models? How much do you expect to pay working with models? What sort of prices, that sort of thing. Um, now we cover some of this uh, in more depth on our, on our courses, but I thought I would uh, touch on the subject today and, and, and talk about that a little bit. A couple of other things that I wanna talk about as well. Now, um, while we've got the opportunity, or while you've got the opportunity, and I've got the opportunity, if you want to ask any questions photography related or otherwise, um, then feel free to ask those questions on the uh, comment section there on Facebook. I'll pick those up on this iPad and try and pick out the best ones and answer those for you as we go. So, okay, let's start off the... Um, the topic about working with models. First of all, why do we use models, okay? It's not just about uh, attractiveness, it's not just about looks. Um, one of the things that I would say was the most important thing about working with models is professionalism and uh, experience and confidence. Because one of the things that really separates a professional model from an amateur model is their ability to take on the character, play the part, if you like, as an actor to fulfill the role um, that you're, you're, you're trying to depict in the photograph. And what I've noticed over the years, having worked with many professional models and many amateur models, is the difference between looks and confidence. Um, and it is a huge gap because when you have the confidence to not be worried about making a prat of yourself or you know, uh, you know, coming across the wrong way, but you have the confidence to do what the photographer asks and apply yourself and, and take on the role, that's when you really see a professional model shine. Also, professional models have this ability, if you like, to almost seduce the camera, to really work with the camera um, in a way that an amateur model, even a very attractive amateur model, doesn't have that same uh, approach or, or same technique. And professional models are often, uh, especially the experienced ones, are quite aware of uh, the photographer and what his um, you know, intentions are with the project and, and how he wants things to work. And they've got a good understanding of the whole process. So it, it makes life a lot, lot easier. Now, professional models come in a lot of different price brackets and what I'm going to do is I'm going to work through look at some of the agencies that I've worked with and give you an indication on the uh, on the pricing of uh, some of these models now um, let's start off um, with this agency here let's take a look at this one this is BMA models in London who I've used a few times this is their main board now they're more what I would call a commercial uh, model agency. So they uh, fulfill uh, uh, general commercial lifestyle style shoots, not necessarily high fashion, but some fashion, but a lot more general mid range commercial stuff. And that means their models are actually quite affordable. They're a good agency to work with, worked with them many times, and um, they've got some good models on their books. Now, I don't know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to hold, you know, I can't hold them to this, but to give you an idea, their commercial rates, uh, I believe, can range somewhere around about 600 pounds, 500 pounds per day. So that's about $700 per day for a model. Um, and that usually, in, you know, they don't require any additional usage fees. So they're sort of com more commercial based model agency. Some of their models may be more, some of their models may be uh, less. I haven't checked um, lately, but they do have a good range of experienced models and I've worked with a few from that agency and the agency is a nice agency to deal with as well. Now, um, if we 
step up a, a level and we go to say this next agency, this is uh, select model management. So they're, they're starting to go uh, higher end commercial, more fashion, more covers, more magazines, that stuff. And we've worked with models from that agency and they've varied in price from about 1500 maybe 1700 to 2500 pounds per day i'm sure they've got more expensive models i don't think they've got any less expensive um, but they've got very high quality models um, that can fulfill those fashion projects and, and more um, you know specialist projects uh, another agency I've worked with, this one, MOT Models. They've got some excellent models that this agency started back in uh, 1980s, I think, late 80s. And they've grown quite rapid, rapidly to become a formidable uh, agency. And again, I, think I expect their models fall in around about the £2,000 a day mark, um, which like, can sound a hell of a lot of money to some of you guys. But if it's a commercial project for a client, and it's modeling clothes or it's modeling products or whatever, then um, you know, working with this type of model means that you're a lot more productive in what you're able to produce. And then you can step it up even more. You can go to model agencies like Storm and some of the big ones, and you may end up paying several thousand pounds a day for a model for a project. And then a lot of model agencies uh, also apply what's called usage fees. So if it's a big project you're working on, an advertising campaign, an international advertising campaign, then the level of exposure that that model is going to get in posters, print, advertising, they uh, charge an additional fee or a license fee period uh, where you're only allowed to publish that image of that model for a specified period as part of the package, as part of the price or whatever you negotiate. And that's another important thing. A lot of these prices are open to negotiation and it does depend on the type of job you're shooting and what you're shooting. Now, there's something really interesting about this as well. If you're a photographer of a decent skill level and you've got a good portfolio, then you can actually um, contact some of these model agencies because what they often have is um, if I go into, let's have a look at the women's section here. Um, have they got it on this page? No, they haven't. Maybe they've got it on this one. Uh, female, new faces. So in the new faces category, these are new models with less experience. And what often happens with new models in the new faces section is the model agency wanna get new pictures of these models. They want these models to get experience. So if you're shooting personal projects or personal portfolio stuff, the agency may well do you a very good deal, very good day rate for the model um, to allow the model to get more experience and allow the model to get some uh, images for their portfolio. So that's an option that some of you photographers can take. Obviously, the agency will want to see that your photography skills uh, are actually suitable and that they're going to get some decent pictures out of it. So it's not going to be available to everyone, but that's just a little bit of information for you on how sometimes you can work with model agencies and the new faces category and you're doing each other a favor. Um, now, there are other alternatives, obviously. We can't always afford uh, top models. Um, let me just show you a couple of examples. So for example, this, this girl here, this is Evie. Now we use Evie uh, quite a lot because she's a local girl. Uh, she's got some modeling experience, but she's not signed with an agency, even though I think she could be signed with an agency. And um, Evie, with a little bit of direction, works really well. So I have to direct her more than I would direct uh, a professional model. Uh, but here's another shot of Evie. But if I give her the right direction, then I can get some really good results uh, with Evie. And we've used Evie on a lot of our live shows. And you see me directing Evie and the results that we get. As a matter of fact, that last image was from uh, our last live show on male and female portraiture. Uh, talking of male portraiture, this guy here, uh, Dave, that we used. Um, I met Dave, got hold of Dave through social media when I put out a shout on social media. And Dave uh, worked out, he's an actor, but he worked out as a great model for a, a number of shoots um, that I've done. And um, it's finding out about these people and using social media can be a great way of engaging with people and um, doing a model shout out, a model call basically, uh, and see uh, who you can get. And in the past, I've even printed letters 
um, explaining that I'm a professional photographer, that I'm working on this project, that I need a model, and actually giving these letters out to friends to give out to friends who could potentially be models, or if you see the right male or female model in the street, pass the, the letter and a business card so they don't have to give you an answer there and then they can literally take that home, read it, uh, look at it and consider it, and then contact you for uh, a test shoot. So there are ways that you can do it um, with amateur models, if you like, or um, unskilled models, but keep in mind that even the best looking girl or best looking guy does not necessarily mean the best model. The best model is someone who's got that certain je ne sais quoi, that certain quality, you know, that um, they can give you something, they can act, they have that confidence, they, they, they can basically portray a character confidently. And quite often you'll find that actors uh, make very good models because they get into um, character. So um, that's one way of um, finding models. Let me just show you a couple more shots here. Another way is like this model here. This is Deborah. Her name's Deborah Frey. She's an independent model. She is signed, I believe, with a couple of agencies, but she uh, also works independently. She's got her own uh, website. Um, her rates are quite reasonable um, uh, as an independent model. And we worked with Deborah for a whole week and she did a fantastic job. And if we look at this uh, picture, we can see how I can get completely different look out of Deborah as well. So one of the great things with Deborah, because she was an experienced professional model, she could do jumping poses, she could do a variety of um, you know, different model poses, and she could change her look completely, and was also skilled in doing her own makeup, her own hair, and everything else. So when you throw all those other equations into the mix, hair, makeup, styling, and what clothes they have, consider all of that as well when working with models. So, um, you know, there are a number of factors. This uh, model here that we worked with was from, um, from Select Model Management, so one of the more expensive, uh, or, you know, one of the uh, slightly more expensive model agencies. Uh, but this model was Karina White. She was a fantastic model. She got into character really well. She played the part really well. Um, so again, you, 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 you know, you do kind of get what you pay for, but sometimes you can find some real gems uh, that are willing to work hard and um, you know, work with you to try and achieve uh, the best results. Now, there are also uh, other websites. I think there's one called Model Mayhem and One Model Place, where are sort of websites where models put their work and speak to other photographers. And that may be all right. I've never used those type of websites, and I worry sometimes about the integrity of the dealings on those websites. Um, but there does seem to be some models that use them, and I see some good work on, on, on those sites sometimes, but I've never actually booked a model uh, through those websites. But I know other photographers that have that um, you know, say, say that uh, it's worked out well for them. So don't be afraid of approaching uh, potential models. Think of uh, actors, drama colleges, drama schools, those uh, local uh, amateur dramatic societies as uh, places where you could potentially find good models that have the confidence to uh, portray themselves well in front of the camera. And then uh, putting out shouts on social media, doing some test shoots with models. Maybe that you can put out a shout on social media and maybe you can get like, you know, half a dozen, a dozen uh, replies and try and arrange one day where you just do some test shoots uh, each hour with these models and see which one has got the confidence or the character that you know, right, this girl or this guy would be great to work with again, and then you can sort of narrow it down from there. With the big model agencies or the commercial model agencies, expect to pay sort of £600, £700, $800 upwards per day, and uh, obviously you can get cheaper deals if you're book booking them for multiple days, and also consider the new faces category where you'll get models but they won't have the uh, posing experience yet because they are new faces and they're basically inexperienced models okay let's have a look and see if we have any questions here first before i move on to my next topic we've got one here kevin lamb says where do you stand on the full frame versus crop argument well there are arguments for both. I mean, I, I, I assume crop cameras are still cheaper than full frame, but for me personally, I'd want to work on a full frame camera. I prefer the full frame format 
the depth of field of full frame. And to be honest, I, I'm actually using even bigger than full frame because I'm usually shooting medium format because of the advantages that that gives me. There are advantages in ISO and low light performance uh, that's often talked about with full frame, but then there seems to be some very good results uh, possible with crop sensor cameras as well. So it's a bit of a mix really, but um, for me, having come from a film camera background and using 35 millimeter film, which is what full frame is based on, 36 millimeters by 24 millimeters, um, that is the format that I've grown up with and worked with in 35mm cameras. So I've always stuck with full frame format cameras and I know that my lenses and my focal lengths and everything to do with that and what I've got embedded in my brain relate to that and what I used to use in film. So for me, I'm on the full frame side of the fence uh, and on the medium format side of the fence, but that does not mean that you can't take great pictures with a crop sensor camera. Okay, uh, Haida, hello Haida. Um, do you always have a written contract when working with models, amateur and professional? Yes, is the answer to that. Um, and as a matter of fact, as a member of Carl Taylor Education, um, you can download some of those written contracts from our download section on our website because in our download section on carltaylereducation.com, we have copyright uh, release forms, uh, model release forms, copyright controls, business contracts. We have all of those documents available for our members to download to use for their business. So you'll find those documents there. And it is always a good idea to, to have those things signed off because even if you've got a good relationship with a model and you're working with her and everything's great, and you, you've said, right, I'm gonna pay you this amount for the day and um, you shoot some pictures. What happens if that relationship goes bad or what if that model changes her mind and then she sees that you've sold some of the pictures to a stock library or her pictures appearing in an advert somewhere that she didn't expect? If you don't have a contract protecting yourself saying that she agreed to let you sell pictures uh, to stock libraries or to future advertisements, that sort of thing, then there is the possibility that model could come back to you and say, actually, I'm not happy with this. I'd like to get paid more money. And if you haven't got a contract stating what the terms of the shoot were in the first place, then you could find yourself in trouble. So the answer to that is yes, uh, use a written contract. But if you don't know how uh, or how those uh, written contracts should be formatted, then as a member on Carl Taylor Education, you will be able to just download those forms and use our template contracts as your starting point. Right, John Archer says, Hi, how should I go about starting a pet and portrait business full time? Well, um, first of all, John, you have to consider the market, just like any business. You know, there are the three vital questions, um, you know, am I good enough? First of all, are you good enough? Are you better than your competition? The second thing, is there enough demand? And then um, what is the, the, the pricing for that demand to supply it? Um, can you make a living from it? Um, those are the fundamental questions you have to ask yourself. They're just normal business questions. So the first thing you should do is go about figuring those things out. It, you, you know, obviously you need to make sure you've got the required skills to stay in business, the required standard of work to do the job properly. Are you better than the guy down the road at doing it? Is the guy down the road in business, is he making money? Because if he's not, and he's really good, then there doesn't seem to be a lot of hope for you to make money either. So you have to look at it from a business perspective first, just as any business does. Beyond that, John, then I would take a look at our business um, courses on our Carl Taylor Education site. We have a number of modules on there that explain the ins and outs of running a photography business. Luz Hardy says, hey, I would like to know what lens would you recommend? I have a Nikon D5500 and what am I going to focus my business in sports? Um, and he's asking what lens I recommend. Um, I don't know if the D5500 is a crop camera or a full frame camera, but if it's a full frame camera and you're looking at sports photography, um, people photography, I think in you know, the 50 to uh, 85 mil range would be good. So a 70 to 200 2.8 would be a good all rounder lens. 
and then potentially one wider angle lens as well. This is always difficult to, um, to, to calculate, but you know, in my 35 mil kit bag, to make sure that I've got a number of things covered, my most common lens is a 16 to 35 millimeter, fixed 50 millimeter 1.2, an 85 millimeter 1.2 and a 70 to 200 2.8 and a 1.4 and a two times converter. And I find those assortment of lenses pretty much cover me for everything that I need to shoot when I'm shooting 35 mil. Um, next question. Hello, Carl. Want to choose between a Canon 50 and a 70D? I have no idea what those cameras are. I don't even know what a 750D is. I don't know what a 70D is and I'm afraid I don't really care um, because as I had in this gear rant the other day, which uh, I believe that question is from Ramisa, Ramika, um, this isn't as important as you think. The things that are most important for getting you great results are completely different to what you've got in mind. Now, I know people get concerned about gear. They want to make the right decision. They want to make the right purchase. But go and watch one of our previous rant episodes to find out why this is not the most important aspect. And as long as you've got a functioning camera that um, by today's standard is gonna be way better than the cameras I used to use 20 years ago, and I was able to get amazing results with those cameras 20 years ago, and uh, the cameras of today, you know, blow those cameras from yesteryear out the water. So um, go and check out that previous rant video. Um, Christopher Stubbs, how do you handle it if a model doesn't show, oh, there's a fly there, I'm gonna get that fly. He says, how do you handle it if a model doesn't show up to a shoot. Well, first of all, she doesn't get paid. Um, that's the first thing, because that's obviously uh, completely unprofessional. Um, but I don't know, that's never happened to me, Christopher. Um, it depends, I guess, whether your arrangement was a professional arrangement or whether it was an amateur arrangement or what it was. Um, but you certainly wouldn't be paying the model if she didn't arrive on the job. Um, no idea. Dave Kerwin says, for an amateur or less experienced model, is it worth having a makeup artist or not if the model can do her own. Um, just jump back to um, these pictures here. Th this uh, is Deborah, she's a professional model, but she did all her own hair and all her own makeup. And Evie, that I've worked with uh, several times, again, Evie has done all her own hair and her own makeup for us. And obviously that keeps the costs down. Um, but when we're on working on bigger campaign shoots, then like this one, we had a stylist, we had a makeup artist, hairstylist, props, crew, everything. So it depends completely on the scale of the project and what your budget is and whether it's a project for yourself or whether it's a commercial project. Um, but it, usually if it's for yourself and it's portfolio stuff, then try and work with the model, organize the clothes, see if she can do her own hair and makeup, try and keep your costs down. Because if you're just doing shots for your portfolio, um, then yeah, obviously if she can do her own makeup, it's going to save you a, a ton of money. Right, Mike. Constable says, hey, any way to save a little money when shooting food? Example, steaks, meats, etc. Don't quite know what you mean by that, Mike, how to save money shooting food. I mean, food photography, as we demonstrated in our recent tutorials, is, doesn't need to be expensive at all. The props we showed you that you can find and source quite cheaply, the lighting setups that we showed you that were quite simple, um, all of those things uh, in our food tutorials showed you actually how to do this stuff really cost effectively. Um, you know, whether you're talking about the food being too expensive, I don't know, but obviously we can't help with that because if you've got to photograph the object, then someone's going to have to uh, purchase the object. Um, Michael J. Fundo says, is it normal for the clients you shoot to be impatient? Um, no, it is not normal. Uh, my clients are not impatient at all, actually. Uh, there was some times back in the day when I used to shoot a lot of corporate headshots for um, uh, corporate uh, PR and annual reports and that sort of stuff, where the chief executive you were photographing didn't have a lot of time to spare, so um, you, you had to work quickly. But instead of them being impatient, what we did was I'd arrive with my assistant asked that, that, that we had the, the, the location or the space available, so it was either going to be in a different office, meeting room or something. And I would set up the whole shot and the lights and everything with my assistant to practice so that I was ready 
at a given time for that CEO to walk in, sit down, a few introductions, how you doing, how's things going, blah, 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 a little bit of chit chat, shoot the picture, and then it was done. And I knew it was gonna be in the bag, and it was great because I'd already tested it and had everything in position. So that's how you avoid the impatience with some uh, you know, high-flying business execs. I don't do a lot of that sort of stuff anymore. Most of my work is more advertising, photography, product-based. And the type of people I work with are art directors. So art directors come to my studio. As a matter of fact, we were doing a shoot with some art directors. It's been a really big. We've done six days of solid photography uh, almost in the last uh, week or two. And um, there's still a shoot set up there from yesterday. You can see my Hasselblad hanging on the... Uh, how do I do this? Hanging on the mono stand off the end of the uh, Manfrotto mono stand for this project we were shooting, these plan view, I can't actually say what it is, but these symmetrical layout things we were doing for an advert. Um, now, when I work with an art director, they're here all day. Yeah, you're normally spending a day doing one shoot or one concept, maybe a few different things. Um, and art directors know how long these things should take. And generally, they are not rushed, you know. You've got a brief from the client, you um, work with the client on that brief, you talk about what you're able to achieve, you give them a price, you tell them how long it's going to take. If they accept that, then they already know how long it's gonna take. So um, if you've got a client that is forcing you and rushing you to take pictures as many as possible, it doesn't sound like that's going to um, result in very good uh, pictures for the client at the end of the day. So you need to change the uh, working approach, the way you work with your clients. And we've got some great advice on that on our Business of Photography course modules in carltaylereducation.com. Right, let me, um, let me talk about uh, a couple of other things on the portrait front here. Um, when working with models, let's go to my screen here, Ben. Um, We've got a number of great tutorials on working with just one light. All of these pictures here were shot with one studio light only. And uh, most of them, it could have actually been one speed light as well. So every single one of those photos was taken with one light only. Uh, and these are here at the top level uh, with Deborah, who's a professional model. And these ones here are with Evie, who's not a professional model. So in those uh, example tutorials, you see how I direct the models. Then we've got a set of tutorials on how to do it two lights. And again, we're using some amateur models here, even myself as the model, and we're using Deborah as a professional model. Three light setups, including business portraiture, um, location stuff as well in this course, four light setups where we get into a little bit more advanced stuff, location setups, business portrait lighting setups as well. All of those are covered in our new course, Light Source, and that course is available on carltaylereducation.com. You can get access to that course for just $14 per month. So even if you want to just dip in for $14 and watch that course, there is some really valuable information in there that will relate to working with models, shooting with models, directing models, all that sort of stuff. Um, right, now let's take another question. Uh, Paul Madison. Hi, Carl. I own horses and enjoy photographing them, but I always struggle to get the, both the rider and horse sharp. How can I achieve this? Well, Paul, first of all, look, it's, it's physics, okay? It's fundamental stuff, right? First of all, is your camera sharp? You need to establish that. So put your camera on a tripod and photograph a fixed object at a fixed position in autofocus and check the result on the back of the camera. Zoom in and check it. Is it pin sharp? So is the lens working and focusing correctly? Then move the object, do it again, do it again. Do this at full aperture, so the shallowest depth of field possible. Prove to yourself, by the camera not moving and the object not moving and the autofocus working, prove that it actually works. Because this is a common mistake. People say to me, oh, I shot 1.8 on my lens, the model's not sharp or, you know, the subject's not sharp. And I say, well, you know, 1.8, you're working with a depth of field about this much on an 80 millimeter lens. So it only takes you to sway a little bit as the photographer or the model to move a little bit and it's not gonna be as crisp as it could be. So first of all, establish that the lenses that you're talking about, that you're using here, are pin sharp. Then the next thing you've gotta do is think about the uh, focusing point. Are you focusing on a predetermined point where the model, uh, the, the, the horse 
and the rider are going to be, where you expect them to be. Orz Recker and I did a really great how-to video that you can find on Broncolor's how-to section about a horse rider jumping over a, uh, you know, the horse, um, what do they call those things? The horse, you know, try horse jump things. Yeah, horse jump things. We did a great little tutorial on that uh, and Orz does exactly the same. We pre-focus in manual to the exact known point where the actual action is going to happen. Now, I've done uh, other times where I use the servo focus uh, on the Canon cameras where the camera tries to track the object moving towards you. Sometimes it does it well, sometimes it does it badly. I've done it on sports photography and different things, and the success rate on that can be 50-50. Um, so there are limitations if the object's moving fast towards you, but if they're moving across you or sideways or just slightly towards you and you know the best moment is going to be at position X, then, um, you know, that's what you need to think about. I mean, let's, let me give you another example. Um, let me just find it first. Um, right, so take this picture here, for example. I shot this picture in my studio and I had to calculate exactly where the bird was going to be with its wings out just before it came to land. I had to calculate the position of all my lights, the position of the backlights through the feathers, the position of the glowing light on the wall, and every other, every other element of that photograph had to be calculated. And it was done in manual focus because the camera focus point was pre-selected because I needed the action to happen at that point, the lighting to hit that point, the bird to be at that point, and that's where my focus point was set. So you have to think about the fundamentals of the shot in terms of focus, whether manual focus would be better at a pre-selected point or whether autofocus or continuous autofocus. And the only way you can have the confidence in your autofocus system is if you've tested the camera locked down on a tripod, photographing fixed objects at different distances at full aperture and checking that they're 100% sharp. Ashley Barnard says, do you meet up with a model before the day of the shoot to ensure you can both work together and get along uh, from the same page, uh, so to speak, before you pay? Although I would imagine paying 1,500 quid for a model, they will be more professional than models for a few hundred pounds. That's a very good point, Ashley, and you're absolutely right. Uh, we don't always meet up with um, models, at the, the top end models, the expensive ones, but what we do often do is a casting. And a casting is where if it's a campaign shoot for uh, an advertising campaign and we're not sure which model would be the best, the model agencies are willing to send the models on a casting. So you arrange a, a meeting at your studio or a predetermined location and the models come in uh, for you know 10, 15 minutes to just shoot a couple of test shots, talk to you, take on the character of the person that you want them to portray in, in the advertisement and you basically, it's almost like a test, it's a model test. And you can um, use these castings to then decide on the model that wins the contract. Now, generally, a lot of agencies will only bother with castings if it's worth, you know, the rate of the booking, that sort of thing. Um, but castings is one way. There's other times where we've just booked models without castings, just based on their portfolio pages on the model agency's website. And if you're paying that sort of money, then you can expect to get a good job out of them. However, as you pointed out there, Ashley, for example, when I've worked with models on like a two or three day project and I've only met the model on the day, I normally sit down for the first 30 minutes with the model and, you know, completely brief the model about what we're trying to achieve. Get the model engaged in the project. Let them understand what you're doing. Let them know what you're going to try to do. Let them know what you expect of them and get them to be enthusiastic, you know, about the project and, uh, you know, because obviously that rapport and getting them on side makes a huge, huge difference. If you're working with amateur models uh, and they're local to your area, then yes, of course, you know, get them in for a meeting, show them your work, uh, build their confidence by letting them see that you shoot good work and then sort of taking it um, from there. Okay, uh, next one. Um, Ramika, he's back again. Thank you for your answer, Carl. I intend after I buy a camera to become a member of Carl Taylor Education. Well, that's good to hear. And I think you'll find actually knowledge and education is going to put you a lot, lot further than whichever camera model it is. That I can uh, guarantee you. Um, Jeff Guthrow says, hello, Carl. When starting out, would you advise using models to build your portfolio on a website? Um, if so, how many would you see 
use to build the portfolio. Right now I have some from clients posted in samples, but I'm thinking that models would help in converting potential clients. Well, you know, it's amazing how much you can do with one model because um, as I said in, um, you know, let's take a look at this again. Look how many different looks we're able to achieve. So this here is all the same model on this row. This is the same model on this row. So look, she's wearing a wig there. That's her, her, her natural hair. And then, you know, different looks again here, different looks again from Deborah, um, different looks again, you know, so you can achieve many, many different looks with one model, um, with a number of different outfits, a number of different hairstyles, makeup, etc., poses. Um, so it depends how much variety and who you're pitching your work at. But, you know, maybe in a, a shoot with four or five different models, you can create something like what looks like 20 different models on your website because you know quite often I can show a client a picture of a model and then I show them another picture and they they don't even recognize it's the same model sometimes when I say that's the same model there if you're interested in booking a that's her there and that shot they can often be quite surprised and not even realize it's the same model so um, how many you need I don't know that really depends on um, what you're trying to achieve um, but um, yeah, it depends on your market, your target market, who you're aiming at and, and, and what sort of work you're trying to do. Um, now, talking of target markets, um, let's have a look at this. Wedding photography with David Stanbury. Now, David is a top wedding photographer, award-winning wedding photographer, shoots some amazing pictures. He's run a successful wedding photography business for donkey's years. He's joining me live next Thursday, the 12th of October, 6 p.m. BST, that's uh, 1 p.m. EST. And we're gonna be discussing all things wedding photography. We're gonna be talking a little bit about marketing, a little bit about his work, his techniques, how he does stuff. We're gonna be talking about posing, dealing with clients. So if you make, if you make a living or a part-time living from wedding photography, you wanna pick up some great tips. That's our next proper professional live show over on Carl Taylor Education, uh, carltaylereducation.com. Sign up for $14 and then uh, you can tune in with me and David on that show and you can ask David questions live. Um, so he'll be, able to, um, he'll be able to help you out. Our next show after that is on product photography. I'm gonna be doing some wine bottle photography the week after on Thursday the 19th of October. So if you're into product photography, you wanna see some great lighting techniques on bottles, glassware, that sort of stuff, then I'm gonna be doing some amazing stuff live in that live show. Again, remember our carltaylereducation.com platform, it's going down an absolute storm because our members are getting to see all of this stuff happen live for $14 a month and they get access to every single bit of training we've ever produced. That's $4,000 plus worth of training, plus the live shows, plus new courses coming online every month, plus all our downloadable resources, model release forms, uh, copyright documents, business stuff, all of that stuff, $14 a month. So it's an absolute bargain and people are loving it. And we are loving the interaction that our members uh, are taking place with each other on the forum and the comment section. Go check out the comment section on some of our courses to see the amazing praise that um, we're getting there and how people are enjoying stuff. Um, right, here we are, next question. Christopher says, how do you feel if the model wants to bring a chaperone? I've got no problem with that at all, Christopher. Um, personally, I don't like shooting young models. Um, we get a lot of applications from young models, like 15, 16 year olds, and I'm, I'm not interested because there's just, it, I find there's too much hassle with that. Uh, young models too inexperienced and I think they can be too uh, vulnerable to criticism. Uh, so I don't really get involved with any models or model photography unless they're sort of 18, uh, sometimes 17 as an exception, but generally 18, 19, 20 older. Most professional models uh, that we work with from agencies can vary in ages from 18 to 28 uh, and even classic models sections where it's a, a, where you're working on a project where they need older people, they may be in their 40s. Um, if it's a younger model, they'll feel more comfortable bringing uh, a chaperone, uh, particularly a 17 year old, maybe an 18 year old model. And I've got no problem with that. I've um, shot um, models before with their friends or, or, or whatever, or a chaperone guardian, whatever. Absolutely no problem. Doesn't affect the way I work 
isn't going to affect me. I mean, quite often when I'm shooting, we've got cameras or an audience or workshops or when I'm working with clients, I've got an art director and two clients here watching the shoot. So I'm completely okay with it, no problem at all. On the bigger shoots, when we're doing campaign stuff with models, then uh, you've got makeup artist, hairstylist, uh, clothes stylist, client, uh, art director, you've got five or six people plus two or three assistants. So you've got eight people watching you work with the model anyway. So it's just perfectly normal for me, not an issue at all. Um, Gabrielle Blancas, I think that is, says about lenses for any camera is the same. Who, who passed me that question? What, what does that question actually mean? Uh, uh, About lenses for any camera is the same. I don't, oh, sorry, Gabrielle. A crop sensor or a lens, focal length is different on a crop. Yeah, if that's what you mean, Gabrielle, is the focal length different on a crop sensor or on a, on a full frame? The focal length isn't different, but the result is different because the crop sensor crops in uh, to a different portion. So effectively, a 200 mil lens looks a bit more like a 300 mil lens because it's a tighter crop. Um, so the, um, qualities or, or effect that is uh, achieved or re resolved with that lens will look different in terms of the crop but the focal length and the physics of it remain the same um, but I'm not quite sure if that's what you meant maybe you can clarify uh, and ask the question a little bit more uh, clearly. Danny Bell says nice chat Carl go have a cold one do you mean a cold Grolsch, Foster's or um, Heineken, Danny, I'm going to choose Grolsch if you do mean that. Now, talking of questions, I've got a question that came up. Um, we posted this video, we're nearly out of time, but we're going to just finish up a couple of things. I posted this video on YouTube just the other week, how to prepare your photos before uploading them to your website. Now, what I did in this video was explain what I do to my photos, how I size them, how I sharpen them, how I add copyright logos, uh, what I do to prep them to make sure they look good when I put them on my website. So it's the sort of pre-work that I do to them before I put them on my website. And then what I did was I gave a couple of extra tips on creating copyright logos, different types of like transparent copyright logos or low opacity ones, that sort of stuff. And I included that. So on this YouTube um, tutorial, and Ben's just gonna bring the page up again for me, uh, on this YouTube tutorial, I uh, cover all of that in this 20 minute uh, thing, which we just posted the other day on YouTube, uh, two days ago on YouTube. And uh, Kryn asked, he said, um, nice little tutorial for preparing uh, the images for the website. So I have a question for you regarding logos, copyrights. So you use a small, subtle copyright statement. Is there a particular reason why you make it as unobtrusive as possible besides for when you show the images to your clients. Some people use more obvious logos to prevent theft. How much of a concern is this to you? Also, could you see a scenario where a nice logo could possibly enhance the image look whilst at the same time provide copyright protection? By the way, loving the courses on the website. Hi, Kryn. Um, I thought this was a good question, um, so I'm gonna answer it. I use a very discreet, simple logo in the bottom corner of my pictures. I do it because I just want to put an identity tag on the pictures. I know it can easily be cropped out, removed, or whatever, but at least it's there, so I've identified myself as the author. Also, in the file info information, I've embedded that the work is copyrighted, so that anyone looking at the file info can see who the author of the work was, even if the thing was uh, cropped out. Now, obviously, people can reprocess these images. They can nick them. They can do that. I weigh up the advantages of having a clean image on my website, clearly visible for potential clients, as more advantageous than them being stolen off my website with a more intrusive copyright logo. So for me, I don't find it an advantage to have an intrusive copyright logo that detracts from the image. I don't like those big copyright logos in the corner because they could still be easily smudged out and 
um, you know, photoshopped out. And actually then they detract from the quality of the picture. I don't believe there is such thing as a really nice logo to add on a photo, which is why I keep mine as minimal as possible. If you look at my main website, carltaylorportfolio.com, which is, um, you know, where I uh, publish my images, um, let me just go to the overview page, um, you'll see, for example, like on some of my work, actually, I don't even know if we can see it on that one. I don't even know if I put it on that one. Um, I definitely put it on some recent ones. Okay, so for example, this one, if you look down in the corner, there is a very subtle copyright Carl Taylor logo. And I keep it really subtle because I don't want to ruin the picture. Uh, so putting a heavier copyright logo on there isn't my thing, doesn't work for me. And, you know, I'm all about the imagery. It's all about the picture. I need the pictures to be seen at their best. So I'll take my chances on the copyright thing. I'm also quite fortunate because I'm a sort of better known photographer. Um, whenever we have had a copyright infringement and someone's seen my work and recognized it on another page, they've uh, generally emailed us and said, hey Carl, saw this picture here, didn't know if you knew about it. And we're very thankful uh, for our followers for doing that and bringing those cases to light. It's happened a couple of times and, and usually, um, you know, the perpetrators just get caught out and um, we slam them with a big heavy usage fee or a fine or whatever, or um, they get it uh, taken down. So, um, no, oh, Gabrielle now has come back and says, what brand is recommended for lenses? Well, obviously I, I prefer the brand that makes the camera. So if I'm using a Canon camera, I actually prefer using Canon lenses. Hasselblad, obviously I've only got the option to use Hasselblad lenses and they are the best lenses you can get your hands on. But there are plenty of independent brands um, such as Tamron, Sigma, uh, a good friend of mine, colleague, photographer, Alex Wallace, he swears by some of the Sigma that, that fly is gonna get it. He swears by some of the Sigma lenses and he switched a lot of his lenses to Sigma. I'm not completely familiar with uh, the Sigma lenses. I have used some Tamron lenses years and years ago that seemed pretty good. So um, some of the main independent brands I'm sure are gonna be great. And um, you know, the actual main camera manufacturer brands are gonna be great too. Don't get too hung up on this Gabriel, Gabriel, because the fact is that the lenses that are being made today are 10 times better than the lenses I used to use 10 years ago. And I've got pictures on my portfolio that were taken from 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, using those older lenses, which wouldn't even come close to uh, today's lenses. Okay, um, finally, uh, so I mentioned the video on here, if you want to check that video out on YouTube, how to prepare your photos before uploading to your website. Uh, it's a really informative 20 minute video. Uh, also, um, competitions. We've got some great competitions coming up in October. You can win our long exposure Lee filters kit worth $472. Um, and then in December, we're giving away a Canon 5D Mark IV worth $3,299. Can you believe it? We're giving that away in December. Now you can enter those competitions very simply by being a member on carltaylereducation.com. Those competitions are only open to our members. Every quarter, we give away great prizes. So we give away filters, tripods, uh, cameras, Cirrus studio lighting kits. That's how grateful we are to our members. Uh, so for $14 a month, not only do you get access to all our amazing training, plus our amazing live shows, you get access to gear discounts from top brand companies, you get to enter these competitions and win these top prizes, and you get all of our uh, business resources and documents as well. So if you're not yet a member on carltaylereducation.com, then you are missing a huge trick, as many of our current members will tell you. Uh, just go and check out some of the comments below our videos to see uh, how they're raving about it. Um, and we've got another great um, live show coming up soon as well as the wine. We're going to be doing a whole batch of new photography sessions on new product photography courses, including cosmetics, perfumes and stuff like that soon as well for those of you that are interested in product photography. Okay, guys, thank you very much for tuning in. Hope that was useful on the talk about working with models and I um, hope that gave you a little bit of information and insight on uh, how to handle some of those situations. We'll see you next time. Thanks very much.